Good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us again in another Monty Heart. I apologize for my background, but the weather in New York is running havoc, so um, it's a little crazy with the snow this morning. But it's a real pleasure on this snowy day to have Asma warm the situation. Um, Asma Kalik is one of our partners here at Monty. She's the director of endovascular therapy and, and a very, very highly trained interventional cardiologist uh, with excellent, excellent skills in the lab and personally and clinically. And so we're very de delighted to have been able to steal her away from other institutions in New York um, to come help us run this program. And so since she's been here, she's been very instrumental in starting up a PERT program. So we thought what we'd like today is for Asma to maybe give us some background on pulmonary embolism and on the modern management of pulmonary embolism, but then also talk a little bit about how you go from becoming aware that this is an issue and we need to do something about it to then actually instituting a PERT program in your own hospital because she's doing that right now and facing some of the challenges that are in every institution with trying to start up a PERT program, but hopefully she can sh share some of those with us, which will be useful for those of you who try and do this in the future. Asma, thank you once again. It's always a pleasure listening to you. All right, thank you very much, Azim. That was uh, that was a very kind introduction. So um, I'll jump right to it. So I'll talk about management of PERT today and also um, uh, eventually build up to how to build a PERT team. Uh, so interesting, it doesn't, sorry, one second. I'm having a little glitch. Oh, okay, got it. So, um, before I jump in, I just want to talk about uh, the burden of disease. Pulmonary embolism affects 900,000 patients in the U.S. So I'm, when I say pulmonary embolism, I mean venous thromboembolism, which is both DVT and PE. So as, as you can imagine, almost close to a million people are affected. And as you can see that uh, about 100,000 or so deaths are attributable to VTEs every year in America. And 25% of uh, the patients who have pulmonary embolism, their first symptom is sudden death. And as you can also see that 33% uh, of the patients uh, this, uh, will have either a recurrent DVT or a long-term complication uh, such as post-traumatic syndrome or pulmonary hypertension, et cetera. So as, as, as this slide from CDC, CDC shows that the, the, the burden of disease of pulmonary embolism is quite extensive. Again, uh, just wanted to bring home the point that not only is this the burden of disease so high, it, the, the cost of the disease is equally high. As you can see that uh, there about 10 billion US dollars are spent on the treatment and management of venous thromboembolism uh, every year in the US. So, um, so jumping a little bit uh, right into the pathophysiology and the predisposing factors of VTE. So this uh, uh, slide basically tells us strong, weak, and the moderate risk factors for VTE. Um, you know, I won't belabor this much, but we know that the strong factors are those in which the odds ratio of having a, a venous thromboembolism is more than 10, and moderate being two to five, and low, or weak risk factors being the ones which have less than uh, twofold increased risk. So if you have a fractured extremity, if there's, you have hosp someone's hospitalized for heart failure within the last three months or a knee or uh, hip trauma or any major trauma, MI within the last three months, previous VTE and spinal cord uh, injury are considered uh, strong risk factors. Uh, while as arthroscopic surgeries, autoimmune diseases, chemotherapy, current cancer, IVF, being on an oral contraceptive pill or hormone therapy, HIV, IBD, and stroke, and also superficial uh, thrombophil uh, thrombophilia, and any uh, throm uh, thrombophilic state is considered um, a moderate risk factor. So just, just to give us an idea of uh, who these patients are that we should be looking for. Uh, and also, before I uh, jump right into the topic, I just want us to remember from med school days that this casket of the uh, hemodynamic collapse and uh, RV deterioration that happens because of acute PE, which ultimately can lead to our, a patient's demise. So just remember that once a PE occurs, it leads to RV dilatation, 
which will cause tricuspid insufficiency, increase in wall tension, neurohemorrhoid activation, which causes an RVO2 uh, demand to go up and causes more AV shunting, and again, leads to RV ischemia, decreased contractility, decreased LV preload, cardiac output goes down, systolic the blood pressure, eventually coronary perfusion goes down, and uh, again, RBO2 delivery goes down. And this is basically the uh, unfortunate cascade of obstructive shock, which leads to uh, rapid deterioration uh, in the patients with PE. Um, so, so jumping right into the ESC uh, guidelines, sorry, there's a typo here. 2029 hasn't occurred yet, but I guess um, it's 2019 actually. So these are ESC guidelines from 2019 which basically give us some, so this is the most uh, current guideline document that we have of any society, uh, which is again, as you can see, it's um, a few years old now. So again, uh, you know, they, they recommend getting a C CT to make a quick diagnosis in patients who we suspect having PEs, which we all know, and instituting therapy with unfractionated heparin without delay. Uh, again, I just wanted to bring up one point here is we use D-dimer quite frequently, especially in the emergency rooms. They obviously recommend using D-dimer in patients who have lower intermediate risk probability uh, because obviously it's a screening test. What they also recommend is using a age-adjusted cutoff for D-dimer. And they recommend this formula of age multiplied by 10 uh, micrograms per liter in patients who are over 50 years of age. So meaning instead of just a random cutoff of uh, a generalized cutoff, for example, of 500, uh, which we used to use, now they recommend age-based cutoffs. Um, the next slide basically talks about, again, oh, wow, okay, sorry, I, I, I think I'm in 2019, unfortunately, I mean, 2029, unfortunately. So again, this uh, CTPA, uh, you know, is, is recommended uh, and uh, it basically has a class one recommendation. Again, in patients who do, cannot get a CTPA, VQ scan is also a class one recommendation and it is best to rule out PE, meaning if it's completely stone cold normal, that's a class one recommendation. Also, if there's a very, very high suspicion, if it's a very high probability scan, it's uh, also helpful, meaning it's 2A, but non-diagnostic scans should be further clarified with the compression ultrasound. Again, they incorporate the compression ultrasound also in their algorithm. So patients who cannot, for whatever reason, get, um, get um, the other modalities and you have a high clinical suspicion, the presence of a proximal, meaning an iliofemoral VVT on a compression ultrasound uh, is very highly suspicious and corroborative of, um, you know, and helps to make your diagnoses. And MRA is obviously not recommended. It's a level of recommendation three. Um, so going into the restratification of PE, so we will talk a lot about this a simplified uh, FESI score, which is basically, a, a, it, it's a simplified version of the extensive FESI score, which has a lot more variables, but this simplified uh, FESI score has basically six variables, which, which basically is a PE risk stratification score, and it's, it's a PE risk stratification index, actually, as they call it. So age more than 80, cardiopulmonary disease, presence of cancer, so solid blood pressure less than um, 100, heart rate more than 110, and O2 sats of less than 90. Each gets a point, and as you can see, the score of zero, which basically we will later see that it helps to define low-risk PE, basically has a, a significantly less mortality, just one person mortality of short-term mortality of 30, 30 days, compared to even if you have just one of these uh, uh, one of these in your patient, so that significantly increases the mortality about to, to about ten percent. So um, now again, based just keeping that context in mind, we uh, I just wanted to bring to light this uh, this risk stratifications based on ESCs and AHA's uh, guidelines or recommendations. So AHA has a little bit more simplified uh, or simplistic, I should say way to um, classify PE. Massive in both is basically anyone who has hemodynamic instability, and these constitute about 5% of the patients who come through the, come through the ER, come into your hospital. And um, so anyone who, has, who came in with the syncope, anyone who has a systolic blood pressure of less than 90, or has a drop in a 
in systolic blood pressure, a sustained drop of more than 40 mmHg, which is not attributable to like, let's say hypovolemia, arrhythmias, et cetera. So that is defined as a high risk or a massive PE. So the other category is I wanna first talk about is the low risk, which basically is anyone who has a PE, but has neither signs of RV dysfunction nor biomarker and is biomarkers and is hemodynamically stable. So this is the lowest risk PE, which is, and most of the PEs that come into our ERs are basically this. So 40 to 60% of the patients come in with low risk PEs and their mortality is just 1%. Now, then this middle category, which gets a little, which I want to get a little granular about here, which basically the AHA classifies both of these as submassive, which is basically anyone who has either RV dysfunction or RV injury as, as shown by biomarkers. So either or. So they are classified as submassive according to AHA. But ESC, and I personally like this classification better because it, as I'll show you why later. So it classifies the high risk intermediate group, which is the patients who have both RV dysfunction, either based on echo or CT scan, as well as elevated biomarkers. So those would be considered intermediate high and the patients who have just one of those two would be considered as intermediate low. So now, as you can see, the mortality of this group varies from three to 15%, depending upon how bad they're on the spectrum. So I think it's a little simplistic to classify this as, as one. And uh, these are also, these also constitute a significant chunk of patients that come through the ER, which is basically about 35 to 55% of the patients. So um, without uh, belaboring this again, it is just another way to say what I was just saying in the previous slide. This is a little bit uh, more about the ESC classification and you know, just gives a better visual of who these patients are. Again, uh, the reason I think the intermediate low and intermediate high are important to discriminate is because you can see according to this study uh, that was published in the European uh, Respiratory Journal, uh, you can see that there's a fourfold increase in mortality, PE-related deaths at 30 days between the low and intermediate low versus a tenfold increase in mortality and uh, related to the PE between low and intermediate high patients. So um, another score that I, uh, I think we should, uh, you know, worth mentioning here is the BOA score, which is basically, um, uh, again, a way to uh, classify these intermediate risk patients. Uh, and it, it constitutes systolic blood pressure and heart rate, just like we saw in, um, in the simplified PESI score. However, there is other two things which we did not see in the simplified PESI score. That is the RV injury markers, which is basically um, cardiac tropes and RV dysfunction marker, uh, either on CT or echo. So I think it's a little bit more realistic, but it has not yet been valid, widely validated and has not been used in the studies that much. But just to give us an idea that, you know, the patients who fall on this spectrum can, you know, their mortality can range from anywhere from three to 10%, depending upon how bad they are. Uh, another uh, index that I think is worth mentioning, especially because, uh, you know, sometimes the presence of a normal blood pressure in patients who have what is also called normotensive shock can be uh, can fool us and give us false reassurance. So there's a, this index that's called the shock index, which is basically heart rate divided by systolic blood pressure. And in this study by uh, Keller et al, they basically looked at um, the shock index and uh, saw how it did in terms of identifying patients who did poorly and who had in hospital deaths. So they showed that the, the receiver operator curve was very good and an index of greater than 0 0.89 was, um, you know, was the patients who had that, they, did, they had 11 fold higher risk of dying in the hospital from a PE. So basically anytime you have a patient who is, you know, even low teens like tachycardic and has kind of soft blood pressures, those are the patients we should keep a close eye on. There are some other prognostic markers also that are not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, captured in those scores, which are, as, as you can see, they also have significant impact on mortality. For example, a large clot burden, 
uh, for example, and has 17.6% risk of mortality at six patients versus patients who don't have a large clot burden. And the presence of a central clot also is a bad prognosticator. Presence of concomitant DVT, especially presence of a concomitant proximal iliofemoral DVT, and presence of residual pulmonary vascular obstruction. That's why, um, you know, as, as we talk later, we nowadays with the interventional therapies, we try to get as much perfusion into the lung as possible. Um, now, uh, jumping back, right back into the, you know, the treatment of uh, how do we go about treating all these risk categories. Uh, as you can see that I finally arrived in 2019 with the guidelines. So, um, so basically what, uh, what ESC guidelines recommend is obviously you know, start heparin without any delay in, these, in the high risk group. So we will divide this according to the high risk and the intermediate risk group. So the high risk group start heparin without delay and high risk, they recommend using systemic thrombolytic therapy uh, as a class one level of recommendation B. Uh, I will show you later that this is kind of based on very soft data, but that is the best we got. So that's, uh, that's the reason. So again, surgical uh, pulmonary embolectomy is also class one in patients who have high risk PE, who either have contraindications or have failed uh, lytic therapy. Um, and an important point to make here is that the percutaneous catheter-directed treatments, be those uh, catheter-directed lysis or catheter-guided or directed epilectomy, they are considered class 2A. Uh, and they recommend that they should be uh, considered for patients who have high-risk PE in whom, again, either thrombolytics have failed or are contraindicated. They recommend using norepi and dobutamine for patients who are uh, who have um, in a low uh, who have a right-sided uh, shock and ECMO um, and can be used along with the uh, with the surgical embolectomy or catheter-directed therapy in patients who have refractory circulatory uh, shock arrest or collapse. And the level of recommendation for that is to be. So um, this is um, uh, the PITO trial, which is worth mentioning because. Um, mentioning because this is the best, this is actually only data we have of using, uh, using uh, lytics in, um, in, uh, in PE. So essentially, uh, in this trial, they looked at synecticlase versus anticoagulation alone, and the, the outcome they looked at was all-cause mortality at um, seven, seven days, uh, all, basically all-cause mortality and hemodynamic collapse. As you can see, the tenecticlase arm had better outcomes and uh, they had only 2.6 versus the anticoagulation arm had 5.6% um, uh, uh, you know, outcomes, combined outcomes. However, these outcomes were mostly driven by hemodynamic collapse. And at seven days, their mortality was essentially the same at, as, as it was at three years. And um, also the, the rate of CTEF in both arms at three years was essentially the same. Uh, however, as you can see that the, the initial benefit of reduced hemodynamic collapse in, in this uh, study is sort of uh, uh, outweighed by the fact that about 6.3% of patients had major bleeding uh, in the tenecticlase arm versus only 1.5% in the anticoagulation in, in arm. So just quickly to look at the doses of tenecticlase uh, or, or the doses of uh, lytics to be used. So usually the uh, just the uh, alteplase uh, doses, 100 milligrams given over um, given uh, over two hours. And there's also a modified dose in which you can give uh, over 15 minutes, but no more than 50 milligrams is recommended to be given. And the streptokinase and urokinase doses are there as well. We all know this, the absolute and the relative contraindications of lytics, I will not belabor that. Um, again, just quickly, they, this, since this is, like, this, this is mentioned in the guideline document, I would like to uh, talk about, they recommend using uh, norepi and dobutamine as the preferable uh, uh, vasopressor and, uh, you know, uh, and inotrope because they have specifically have better, um, uh, Better, they increase the RV inotropy better without causing uh, significant other problems. And they also recommend that when they use, when we use dibutamine, we should use it with the uh, with the presser because sometimes it can lead to 
uh, vasodilatation peripherally, and that can uh, you know worsen the hemodynamics. Again, DA ECMO is recommended as well in patients who have had uh, you know who, who are not doing well on pressors and or, or have had circulatory collapse. Um, so now the interventional therapies for uh, these uh, patients, and here are for four of the interventional therapies basically can be divided into two subgroups. This one particular one is the catheter-directed thrombolytic, and the one we will talk about later is catheter-assisted uh, embolectomy. So catheter-directed thrombolytics are essentially uh, ecosystem, unifuse system, McNamara, and Bashir and the vascular catheter. The ecosystem, as we all know, is basically an ultrasound-assisted um, uh, assisted thrombolytics, and most of them are low French, except the Bashir catheter, which is a seven French. And Unifuse and uh, Craig and McNamara catheter are basically catheters with multiple uh, multiple holes, side holes, and essentially, uh, you know, left and to infuse um, infuse lytics. And Bashir catheter uh, has a night null cage which engages the clot, and um, essentially. Uh, does the same and you know that's considered as a pharmacomechanical therapy. So um, now these intermediate and a low risk P according to the 2019 guidelines, how to treat them basically quickly we'll go with this. The same thing, you know, if there's a very low risk patient, we they can, you know, they can essentially uh, be given uh, a DOAC and uh, you know after the initial um, initial 24 hours period, they can be quickly given to the lack and discharge. But the intermediate risk patients, uh, with, and especially the intermediate high risk patients, they should obviously be started on heparin uh, relatively quickly without any delay. And um, again, I just want us to focus here that the rescue therapy is recommended if there's hemodynamic deterioration on anticoagulation. So essentially what I want to bring home the point is that if there was somebody who we initially considered was a low risk or an intermediate low risk, but they are not doing well or have failed have failed uh, heparin, those these categories are not set in stone, meaning the patients can move categories. So if you feel that they're not doing well or you know they they're taking time to improve, then they can their categories can be moved. Again, um, the document also recommends that as an alternative to rescue therapy, surgical embolectomy or percutaneous catheter-directed treatments can be, uh, uh, can be utilized should there be a patient who's having, who's either failing uh, anticoagulation or having hemodynamic deterioration on it. However, obviously they do not recommend using uh, lytics in all comers with uh, intermediate or lower PE because there is no, uh, no um, evidence of benefit and actually harm. Also, one more important point I just want to make here is that patients who have very severe renal impairment, patients who are uh, pregnant or lactating and who have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome should not be getting DOACs. Um, all right, so now uh, back to our catheter-directed lytics and uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the trials that we have. I just want to spend a few minutes on this uh, on this slide. I'm sorry if it doesn't translate uh, too well on the screen, but um, I'll, I'll do my best. So um, there's essentially uh, uh, four big trials of these catheter-directed catheter lytics, uh, catheter the Ultima, Seattle, Perfect, and Optilize trial. Essentially, uh, the recurring theme of these trials is that they all used, um, they all used uh, of ECOS or ultrasound assisted thrombolytic therapy. And as you can see, the number of patients range anywhere from 60 in the Ultima trial to about 100 in optimized trial. And uh, as you can also see that the, the range of um, DPA used was anywhere from eight milligrams um, in one of the subgroups of optimized to 24 milligrams in the Seattle. So essentially, they all looked at very similar outcomes, as you can see, which is RV LV ratio, uh, you know, short term at, at either 24 hours or 48 hours. Uh, so the, the the reason behind this being the meta the in order for us to prove any of the hard outcomes, the trials have to be powered, the numbers have to be humongous. So what the trialists tried to do is they tried to use the surrogates for um, 
uh, short-term mortality. And many trials in the past have shown that the you know, RBLV ratio is a good indicator of um, short-term mortality. So essentially, that is what most of these trials are using instead of actually using hard outcomes such as death, because you know, the, that, would, that would require a lot more patients. Um, so as you can see that most of these, uh, they showed that, um, that catheter directed lytic therapies were pretty good at, at uh, reducing the RV-LV ratio acutely. Um, however, as, as we will later see that, you know, these, um, when these patients are follow long-term, essentially there is no, uh, you know, no long-term benefit uh, of, of uh, in terms of either the RV size or CTAF or any of the others, uh, other parameters between the two arms, except Seattle was just, you know, a single arm study, but, you know, when they compared it to conventional um, uh, heparin therapy, they essentially did not see any difference between the two arms, um, except you do see that there is some increased signal of bleeding um, in all of these trials which use lytics. And this is actually a very uh, a good meta-analysis uh, that they did in, uh, in, and this was published in Dr. Geely's paper and essentially showed that the non-intracranial bleeding was about 4.3% uh, in, 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 the, in the weighted pool proportion of major bleeding in all these trials. And the risk of intracranial hemorrhage was about 0.7 to 1% in all these trials. So, Giving TPA comes at a risk is, is the point I'm trying to make. Um, now, jumping into the catheter-directed therapy. So who are the patients who essentially, uh, you know, should be getting this catheter-directed therapy uh, is essentially people who either have contraindications to systemic lysis or have failed systemic lysis in the high-risk group. In the intermediate risk group, these are essentially patients who are you know, who have hemodynamic deterioration on uh, anticoagulation, again, which means treatment failure, and have contraindications uh, to systemic thrombolysis or have failed um, systemic thrombolytics. So, um, again, uh, basically, uh, as I was trying, the point I was trying to make initially is that it is very difficult to prove hard outcomes with these, uh, you know, with these catheter-directed uh, catheter-directed therapies, and there's no trials currently that have been performed that have actually identified a mortality benefit or decreased hemodynamic collapse in patients who have PE with the use of catheter-directed thrombolysis or catheter-directed embolectomy devices. Essentially, because it is very difficult to power such studies, so it would require us to have like you know. 15, 1600 patients in those, in those studies. So instead, like I mentioned before, we have relied on the surrogate markers of acute uh, and short-term mortality, which is RVLV ratios. Um, and essentially that's what they have done. So these are some of the devices which we use. So um, Angiovac, which is basically a veno venous a bypass device. Uh, 26 French, it requires, uh, you know, it requires um, a perfusionist and it's essentially, you know, uh, mostly used for uh, clots in transit or big RV clots. Um, it's a, uh, and it's, uh, we, I, I would not rec require, I mean, I would not recommend using Angiovac and, you know, and, and, and uh, in pulmonary embolism per se, but it's a very good device for clots in transit. Um, and then we have flow retriever in Ari's device, which is basically a mechanical clot engagement system. And it's basically a massive, it says 20 French, but now they're all, all the way up to 24 French. It's a garden hose, which engages the clot and uses nitinol discs uh, sometimes to engage the clot and essentially has a massive syringe, which um, you know mechanically aspirates. An indigo system, which is basically Penumbra's um, system. And it's again, uh, also a mechanic, a clot engagement system with mechanized aspiration. Uh, and it's, it says eight French, but now we're all the way up to 16 French, the latest generation. And then there is Angiojet, uh, which is a realetic thrombectomy. Uh, it can be used, but um, it comes with actually a black box warning that uh, it may lead to uh, um, significant bradycardia or increased risk of hemoptysis and pulmonary infarcts. Um, and then there's an um, Aspire system, which oh, sort of it's, it's kind of used less frequently. Um, again, just 
Okay, another look at the same. We talked about Seattle, Ultima, and Optolytes, which were all catheter-directed lytic therapies. And this was the initial trials of catheter uh, you know, guided um, uh, embolectomy devices. Square was the initial safety and efficacy trial of uh, Inaris, and Extract was the initial safety and efficacy trial of um, Penumbras. And uh, as you can see, they all use the same RVLB indexes in indices as, as their surrogate markers for, um, for um, acute outcomes. So all of them showed improvement in patients who got either lipid-based lit devices or mechanical uh, embolectomy. And uh, most of you know, and most of them they did okay. Um, point made here is that there's a little signal for um, for um, there were three uh, three deaths in this in the penumbra uh, in the penumbra arm. But uh, if if you read that the, the trial, it's basically all those three patients actually had got lytics before. Um, I just want to uh, quickly talk about this uh, uh, the the flash registry, which basically. Um, uh, they, they discussed this uh, data uh, uh, last year uh, at, uh, at uh, TCT, and it was, uh, you know, it was, we were actually at Lennox, one of the enrollers of Flash as well as Flame, and the Flame data is expected to come this weekend. Uh, and, you know, it was, um, it was basically a well-done study. They had 800 patients, uh, essentially a prospective multicenter single arm study of uh, Inari flow retriever in patients uh, who were uh, who had uh, an all actually an all comers uh, with PE, and their primary endpoint was essentially uh, major adverse outcomes, either device related uh, mortality within 48 hours, major bleeding within 48 hours, and interprocedural or device related uh, adverse effects. And uh, they followed these patients all the way up to six months. Um, and as you can see, these are the uh, patient characteristics. You know, around 60 years of age. Um, Decent amount of males and females were represented. Most of them had concomitant DVTs, and you know most of them had um, systolic blood pressures in uh, in nineties, uh, and a significant amount of them had uh, about thirty percent of them had lipid contraindications, and sixty percent of these were uh, the high risk intermediate high high risk patients, and then um, you know the uh, or I'm I'm sorry the six I'm sorry uh, I I take that back about. Seven to eight percent of these were high risk patients. Majority of them were actually intermediate high risk patients, and some of them were intermediate low risk patients. So the the reason that there's only uh, seven percent of these are high risk patients is because they're coming with the, the that was a whole separate trial. It's a flame trial, and it's expected to come over this weekend. And these were the uh, the things that they looked at. They looked at the PESI scores, biomarkers, RVLV ratios, um, you know, and uh, so forth. So. Again, uh, quickly, just touching upon what the uh, the procedures look like. Uh, all of them were, most of them were femoral access. The thrombectomy time was around uh, 43 minutes. Um, estimated blood loss was about 2 to 225. Now they have this flow saver system, which by which we are able to give back the blood, so that significantly reduces the blood loss. Uh, a few of those patients, about um, at uh, I mean, two, about nine, 19 percent of them also, uh, sorry, two percent of them also received adjunctive therapies, and three of them we had to use ECMOSIN. And uh, as an important point here is that the hospital overnight post-procedure length of stay was three days, and nobody went to the ICU post-procedure. Uh, and these were the immediate hemodynamic parameters they looked at, uh, mean PA pressure, cardiac indices, and uh, uh, transpulmonary vascular resistance. All of uh, so the red ones are the ones pre-procedure and the blue ones are post-procedure. Uh, all of them showed improvements, and um, heart rates improved uh, immediately post-procedure and 48 hours. And supplemental oxygen requirements were significantly lower uh, at 48 hours. And as you can see in the long-term follow-up, uh, which was uh, six months, uh, the latest. And uh, RVLB ratios were, were, you know, continued to be uh, improved, and the RV systolic pressures was a mean of about 25, and RV function was improved in most of the patients had normalized RV function by, at the end of follow-up. Uh, again, the safety outcomes were actually quite impressive. Uh, so the uh, primary uh, major adverse outcome was about just 1.8%. 
uh, and uh, there were 11 major bleeds, which is just 1.4%, and no device-related deaths. And there were three intra-procedural adverse outcomes, uh, two clinical deterioration, and one cardiac injury. And um, again, uh, they looked at the patients who had CTEF at six months. It was 1.2%. If you look at the other studies of patients who have uh, moderate, uh, who have the submassive PEs, it's about three to five percent. So I think that's a success. Uh, again, all cause mortality of these patients was about 0.8 percent. And if you look at, if you compare this to the um, to the other other intermediate risk subgroups who who got just anticoagulation, their mortality ranges anywhere from three to 15 percent. So although this was not, uh, you know, they, they didn't study this in particular, but but I think uh, this is quite a positive outcome. Uh, two of the trials that we should be uh, looking for is one, one is called peerless. It's basically um, comparing um, uh, uh, an RE device to the catheter directed lytic therapy device, catheter, dire uh, catheter directed lytic to a flow retriever, as in mechanical thrombectomy. So, you know, everybody's watching this space because, you know, there has been a lot of talk about, you know, one being better or not. So we will definitely be looking out for, for, for this, um, for the results of this trial. And then there's another trial, which I think is uh, maybe a little bit, um, you know, anachronistic because it, they're again trying to study ECOS and uh, anticoagulation, but uh, haven't we done enough trials of that? But either way, so we'll, we'll be watching out for the results of HIPI2 as well. So, um, which brings me to um, this, uh, the final bit of my presentation is basically, a, a, you know, the PERT teams. So again, this ESC guideline document, which kind of is the Bible of, uh, you know, all the you know, PE care right now, it basically gives, a, uh, it says that uh, the establishment of PERT teams should be considered and it's a level of evidence 2A. What it recommends is set, setting up multidisciplinary teams and programs for the management of high and intermediate risk PE should be considered depending upon the resource and expertise available in each hospital. Uh, and the team should convene in real time and, and which, which will enhance clinical decision-making. Uh, again, um, uh, I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, look at one of these uh, algorithms, which is, and this is an excellent paper. I would recommend everyone taking a look at it. Um, it basically looks at the patients with intermediate and uh, high-risk PEs, and the high-risk PEs both should get anticoagulation, and if there is a success with anticoagulation, meaning the patient's doing exceptionally well, their heart rates are low, they're, you know, satting well, then, you know, just continue anticoagulation. However, if there is either a, con you know, if the patient is not doing well with, you know, they're, you, you know, they're, they're continuing to require oxygen, they're continuing to feel poorly, their heart rates are high, so, and they have um, contraindications to lytics, those are the patients they recommend going to catheter-directed therapy. Uh, and if, um, if they don't have contraindications to lytics, they recommend giving uh, lytics to these patients. Although that in itself is highly debatable because as we saw that lytics come at a cost of bleeding. Uh, again, high-risk PE anticoagulation should be instituted without delay. If no contraindications to lytics, should get systemic lysis, um, and if that is successful, well and good. If it's not, again, catheter-directed therapies. So at this point, there's, uh, you know, most of the guideline documents and papers, uh, basically, there's a contingency for using uh, catheter-directed uh, therapies. Um, so um, just a bit about the, the PERT, uh, you, you know, use of uh, uh, PERT teams. So this was a paper done from Dr. Chaudhry's uh, group uh, from Case Western. They looked at their own data uh, and looked at patient survival before they had the PERT team versus the patient survival after they had the PERT team. And the, as you can see, the hazards ratio of 0.70 and you know, the, PERT, the establishment of PERT teams uh, helped to uh, improve survival in Case Western. Again, they looked at 30-day risk of mortality, bleeding and readmissions. The gray ones are, uh, you know, patients who did not uh, undergo PERT consult, and the uh, dark ones are the ones who, the black ones are the ones who did undergo PERT consult and uh, consultation and therefore advanced therapy. They did significantly better at 30 days and 90 days. And again, 
this is similar data that is uh, from uh, Daniel Schneider and Sanjum Shetty's group uh, at um, Columbia. They looked at their own internal data and they presented this at a bit consortium 2022. And um, essentially they showed that the median length of stay is significantly improved. Uh, requirement for red blood cell transfusion is better. Inpatient mortality is better as well, as well as gastrose bleeding risks uh, are is significantly less severe to moderate, so moderate to severe bleeding patients who had third consults instituted. And, uh, you know, an improvement in RV size and RV function were also better. Um, so again, cases with the third consult had significantly shorter length of stay and had significantly lower frequency of hospital in hospital mortality and bleeding and had better RV outcomes. Um, basically, just the same data, looking at a, you know, a few other things uh, that, you know, that uh, PERT consult uh, was a positive predictor of better uh, in hospital mortality, um, essentially that. And, uh, you know, as, as we talked about, lesser length of stay and less, you know, less adverse bleeding. So these are some of the other uh, hospitals protocols of you know MGH's PERT protocol, NYU's PERT protocol, and Vanderbilt's PERT protocol, essentially um, just for everyone to look at. Uh, and this is uh, actually uh, Ohio State's PERT protocol, which um, you know which kind of um, still has is heavily weighted on the side of using um, athletics, as you can see. Uh, you know, in, in Massive PE, just kind of the standard practice, I would say, in a majority of the institutions uh, is if, if you do have somebody who's having immediate hemodynamic deterioration in front of your eyes, you know, it may not be unreasonable to just treat them with TPA. Uh, however, some have instituted modified those TPAs. And, you know, again, just to show everybody that, you know, that getting quite involved at, a, at an earlier stage is always better. Um, so again, um, the concept of PERT, uh, which we are trying to institute here at uh, Montefiore is basically, you know, if there's a suspected or diagnosed PE, hopefully we, we hope that, you know, the PERT will, uh, act, the PERT activation will occur either by ER or by uh, uh, pulmonology fellows or attendings, and then we, there will be a designated PERT leader who, you know, will basically bring everybody else on the phone call if needed. And, you know, if there's a multidisciplinary consult required at that time, you know, and now in the, in the era of Zooms, or Zoom meetings, and, you know, we can, we can do that at any time of day or night, and then they can execute a plan. So this was uh, essentially just giving you how our PERT team will, we're hoping will look like, um, you know, ER attending to either cardiology fellows or MIC attendings and fellows, and then, you know, Word console will be made. We are hoping to have, uh, you know, IR involved and plus minus vascular surgery. And then uh, cardiothoracic surgery is an important uh, part of the team as well because they will help with the ECMO side of things. Um, I'm, I'm just going to leave, uh, leave you guys with these two slides, which is what we are hoping to um, get instituted at uh, our uh, Weiler campus. This is the ED algorithm of um, how the bird will be activated and, you know, how we will go about try triaging these patients. And this is for in-hospital uh, evaluation of um, uh, algorithm for in-hospital PEs. Um, that is all I have for you guys. Thank you very much. Hey, Asma, thank you so much. That was a phenomenal overview of the field of pulmonary embolism. And I'm sure there are lots of questions. I know I have lots of questions, but once again, thank you and congratulations for you. all your hard work in this area. I know our PERT program here is going to be extremely successful uh, thanks to you. So let's maybe get some, before I uh, ask you the easy questions or, or the hard questions, either way you can see, think of it, let's get some of the fellows involved because I see there lots of hands up here. Um, let's see that. Okay, so I'm gonna go by no order, just what's on my screen. I see Andrea, and is that Manaf? Oh, sorry, is that Suze Faraj with you? So why don't the two of you start? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> Thanks for that talk, interesting topic. I, um, I have just a question. I wanted to ask you, um, who are, when you are called for a PERT consult, um, 
how do you assess candidates who are not so good for this therapy? Do you base this on CT or on clinical characteristics or who is not like a good candidate for such therapy? Uh, when you say such therapy, do you mean like uh, catheter directed? Yes, catheter directed. So essentially, um, I mean, there's, if there's somebody who who has a who has a intermediate intermediate risk, or so you know, anyone with submassive PE who um, has high tropes or has RV limitation, you know, we would hope that they would be considered for especially if they have both, we hope that they would be considered for catheter-directed therapy, but most of the catheter-directed therapy should only be, you know, I think we should look at the patient as a whole. So if there's a patient who has terminal cancer, has a life expectancy of less than, you know, less than six months. So I would consider them, let's say, not to be a good candidate because I would not want to, we would not want to do anything too invasive or too aggressive for them. Uh, again, you know, if, um, if you have, there's actually very, very few contraindications per se to these. And, you know, as, as much as people are scared of the large board devices and whatnot, they are relatively safe, as you saw. I mean, very safe, in fact. And, uh, you know, I, except if there's a patient who has not so good, uh, you know, short term prognosis or one year or six month mortality is high. Then I would not consider them as a as a candidate. But to be honest with you, there are very few patients who are not a good candidate for such therapies, unless if they're not indicated. Meaning, if it's a low risk PE or if it's a low intermediate risk PE, then you know you may just leave them on heparin. But there are very few patients who are who have absolute contraindications to devices if they if they meet the meet, meet the cutoff. Great, Faraj. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kalik, for this amazing talk. Uh, very uh, uh, quick question. And uh, you know how we have time is muscle in uh, heart muscle? Mm -hmm. and massive PE uh, is uh, uh, early intervention uh, 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 like a, you see the difference when some, excuse me, where like patient comes in and after a week they called us versus when patient, that we, they call us from the ED. Is there a difference in terms of prognosis and in terms of operator, how easy to, to retrieve the clot? Thank you. So, so for mass, when you say massive, massive is patients who will have like hemodynamic deterioration, who will, um, you know, the, those, those should be treated immediately. And in, in those, you know, like, so I, I think what you're asking is about the, the sub -massive massive. Yeah. Yes, the submassive ones. So, I mean, it is hard for me to say that there, you know, that there is a there is a specific time. But most of the uh, most of the PERT teams they recommend treating or triaging these patients within within four to six hours. So most of the you know most of the patients who they, but but as you as you see, there's no hard data which will tell us that you know if you don't do this within a certain amount of time, they will do poorly. But most of the people who have actual fully functional PERT teams they will triage these patients within four to six hours. And then, you know, depending upon whatever therapies they, they you know, they are, uh, they are supposed to get, just institute those therapies. And, and these patients can change, you know, a patient that you thought initially may be a candidate, you know, tomorrow did continue to do very well, then, you know, you may change their mind about them. Again, the patient who you thought was doing well, you may see in the morning, they're requiring more oxygen. Sometimes, you know, people who have, concomitant DVDs, they may throw more clot or patients who have underlying like cardiopulmonary disease, they may not do very well, even with a small amount of clot. So these categories can change, but as per se, there are no like hard and fast, uh, you know, timelines for this, but most of the PERT teams, they institute therapies within like four to six hours, but for the submassives, you can even wait submassive, especially the in, like intermediate risk ones who are not, who are not like teaching you know, uh, on the precipice, you can wait even up to about 12 hours, treat them with heparin for 12 hours in the morning, do a six minute walk or see how their heart rate and O2 sats do in the morning. And, you know, you can institute therapies in the morning as well. So unless if they're massive, which they have to be triaged within 30 minutes. So Asma, can I take that a little further? You know, um, yes. so in Europe, uh, when I was doing catheter thrombolysis, we even took some patients for echoes to the, to the, the lab like five to six days later yes. because 
you know, they, they knew they had the problem with amylase. They were sitting at another hospital. They wanted heparin for four days, and they just weren't getting better. And they were still hypoxic. And when we looked at the data, there was data for accuracy even up to a week out. Uh, yes. The efficacy may decrease slightly, but there's still efficacy. When it comes to the when it comes to thrombectomy, I mean, have you found something similar that you can do cases that are even three or four days out, but maybe it's harder to suck the thrombus out? So the, the subacute clots can give you a harder time. But again, like you said, some, some, I mean, this is most of these people have some acute on chronic, you know, type of situation. So we may be able to take out the, uh, you know, the acute component of the clot. And sometimes when we take out clot, we also see this other material, which almost looks like it's a cast of the pulmonary tree. So probably we are taking some subacute organized clot as well. But obviously, the more days pass, it becomes more difficult. But like you said, there's data for equals for up to about two to three weeks as well. And um, you know, we have take I have taken patients one week out also for uh, you know catheter uh, catheter embolectomy, and you know they have done they have done relatively okay. But obviously, if it's a fresh clot, it's much more technically easier. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll keep going across the fellows. Um... Um, I keep hoping one of them is going to ask you the question I want to ask you so that I don't have to ask you, but we'll see. <laughs> Still, way to go. Uh, William? Hi, thank you for your beautiful presentation. We, we learn a lot. So the timing is a uh, is key. So for you, you I can figure out that you reassess the PESI score every 12 hours, maybe. And uh, so that was uh, the first question. How how, how many times you reassess the PESI scores and how long you you, you take to take your decision to do an intervention. And the second question in practice for to prevent the, the rural perfusion uh, edemia, uh, do you practice a sequential approach and how many sessions you do you do you plan for you for your intervention? Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for your question. So 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 let me just uh, try to understand. So you were asking me that well, how often do we need to reassess the patient with the PESI score, right? With the PESI score, if, if we. Yeah, yeah. For the first question, it's uh, yes. how how do you manage the reevaluation? Because you say already that the timing is very important for you, and how how long you take before to to take your decision. So so if so usually like. Like I said, so first, like at whenever the you know per consult is made, usually within thirty minutes you, you can tell what what the way you're deciding. So sometimes the way you're deciding is not necessarily to take them to the lab. Sometimes it's just wait and watch strategy. So if there are patients who are otherwise doing well, you, we sometimes just put them on heparin drip and you know watch them over for tw twelve hours. So let's say we get called at like you know in the evening we got called about a PE. We assess them. You know they look stable. They have a PESI score of you know, which is maybe zero to one, uh, you know, those patients will do fine on heparin itself, except if they have those other indicators, like if it's a central quad, if it's a saddle, which intuitively you think they, sh they should come out. But those patients, according to the trials, will do, will do okay, even, you know, will, will do all right. But, um, but what you do next thing is that then in the morning, you assess them again, you know, make them walk, do a six minute walk, do a O2 sat uh, with ambulation, and you know, assess them at that point. And then you do again, like you do the next day, you can take a look at them again if you have deferred intervention. But obviously, if you are planning to intervene on them the next morning, then you know, then the then the decisions made. Yeah, especially um, you know, uh, many of the that's exactly how we used to do them, and that's why these PERT calls are less. Uh, you know, they're not as. Uh, uh, the immediacy of this is not as as bad as the you know as the semi call. So you can some you. It buys you more time, you know, you have more time. Patients on a heparin drip and then, you know, just reassess them in the morning in 12 hours. And many, many institutions do that. And what was your second question, sorry? Technical uh, issue about uh, how you do your interventional, uh, uh, interventional uh, uh, things. Uh, do, do you do sequential approach in your reperfusion uh, uh, device to prevent the, the edemia of reperfusion. You know what's uh, one of complication you, can. Uh... You you're saying to prevent reperfusion edema? Yeah, yeah. No, not not really. To be honest with you, I mean, uh, I have not had that issue or problem. I, I haven't really seen. I mean, 
I'm sure there is reperfusion injury that happens, you know, just, just like in any vascular bed, but I haven't really seen a problem related to that. Uh, sometimes if you take somebody with a, a quad that has been there for a while, sometimes, you know, especially in the, in the lytic, uh, lytic uh, studies that have seen that they, they could get, um, uh, you know, like a pulmonary infarct and they can have hemoptysis related to that pulmonary hemorrhage, but I have really not seen, seen, seen that issue. Yeah. And, and in, in the same setting, we do multiple aspirations. Um, twice so far, I have to take the patient back because they did worse. Possibly either they was a clot in transit or they threw another DVT. But usually, you know, you just get it done in one setting. But yeah. Great. Uh, we're going over the hour. So I want to get through everybody's questions. So I'm just going to ask you to be a little short with your question. Um, Ahmed. Um, thank you, Dr. Team, and thank you, Dr. Khalik, for an excellent talk. Uh, uh, my question is regarding, uh, obviously, interventional therapy. Uh, so during CDT and during thrombectomy procedures, uh, what should what results should we try to achieve? What, is there any objective way to uh, target the result to have better outcome? Should we routinely perform the right heart cath in these patients before and after the procedure? And my second question is uh, pretty obvious, like, uh, regarding the echoes versus uh, thrombectomy in patients with candidates for both. Uh, how do we choose the which therapy for which patient? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So th those are excellent questions, Ahmed. So so firstly, yes. So we we should do routine right heart cats, and you know that's one of the objective ways to gauge is just how the effect of uh, your therapy on your pulmonary arterial uh, pressure, right? Your PA pressures should should you should see a drop in the PA pressure. Um, the second thing that nowadays most many of us are trying to achieve is perfusion. So, because if you see a big, uh, you know, big arterial tree that is cut off, uh, those are those are the areas that will uh, have infarcts, and those are basically future areas of, uh, you know, possibly CTAF. So essentially, perfusion is what we try to achieve. So as long as you don't have a big area of um, that is uh, unperfused. Uh, and most of the pulmonary tree gets perfusion and you have, you know, some reasonable drop in your um, systolic pressure, those would be the things that, you know, that I personally try to achieve. Yeah. And then between the CDT and, you know, th that's the, the jury is out, right? The, there is literally no objective study or data out there which shows that um, one is better than the other necessarily. But as I showed in, in all those trials, the lysis comes at a cost of bleeding and it's not insignificant. So 2% risk of, about 2% risk of intracranial hemorrhage and about like four to 6% risk of major gusto bleeding. And, and that's not insignificant, you know. So Asma, just a little bit on that, you know, so obviously for efficacy during the procedure, you guys use uh, pulmonary pressures and yes. you use angiography looking for yes. perfusion, right? Yes. I mean, in the old days, I remember it used to be said that, you have to be really take caution when doing a pulmonary angiogram in someone with a large PE mm -hmm. uh, because they can arrest during the pulmonary angiography. Is that no longer a concern? Uh, you know, in, in, when I started doing this in the beginning, I used to, uh, you know, be afraid that every time I gave, you know, someone, and, and most of the times I, I do this with uh, a power injector, like, you know, 10 yeah. for 15 or, 10 for 20, for 900. So initially I, I used to think about that too, but people tolerate this very well. And okay. you know maybe others have a different experience, but in, in my view, in both patients, it, it, even in the, the, the high risk or massive PEs, they seem to tolerate pulmonary and geography oh, okay. really well. Yeah, okay, so it, it has not been my experience. Yeah. Excellent. Julia. We can't hear you. Ah, there you are. Uh, hi, Dr. Good morning, everybody. Uh, wonderful talk, Asma. I just have a question. In your experience, uh, what are the main challenging issues in patients with ECMO that need to get percutaneous embolectomy or catheter-directed thrombolysis? So the main issue is patients who have received uh, lytics, they tend to have a lot of uh, bleeding issues with ECMO. Um, I mean, most of these patients in any ways are in extremis and, you know, they're patients who are massive PE, who have had a hemodynamic collapse and they have 
very high mortalities. However, the main technical issue is that as such with, with uh, the, the catheter-directed therapies, there, you know, catheter-directed embolectomy, there is, there is no such issue. But with the catheter-directed lytic therapy, if you, have, if you have given someone a lytic, so because you know, now you have a 16 French RDL cannula in leg, probably an integrate axis and another 24, 26 French in the vein, and you've given someone a uh, someone TPA that 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 is that is a little bit of a scary situation and that it causes increased uh, complications with uh, with with ECMO. But per se, there 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 is no no issues with using ECMO and catheter directed throm thrombectomy. In fact, you know it's in patients with uh, massive PEs. Many institutions their they institute their protocol is to first put an ECMO and then you know quickly um, reperfuse and that kind of gives you like you know it's kind of an equivalent of a protected PCI. So it gives you it, it gives you some uh, you know advantage and hematine stability during the procedure. But when they reperfuse, they're doing it mostly with thrombectomy, correct? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Yes. Because even with the catheter directed thrombolysis like echoes, you use small much smaller doses than systemic. Correct. I mean I still worry with the 16 French cannula in an artery about bleeding and bleeding around the cannula and so on. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yes, yes. The, the dose is absolutely, the dose is almost one fourth. Like most of these drugs, they use around 24 milligrams, 25 milligrams mm -hmm. in 24 hours versus right. 100 milligrams in two hours. So obviously it, it's much less, but you're right. There's still, still obviously a risk of bleeding. Excellent. Matteo? Uh, good morning, Dr. Kalik. Thank you for the, for the amazing talk. Good morning, everyone else. Um, so I just have a quick question, I guess, about the device landscape and kind of innovations going forward. You mentioned maybe four or five devices. Uh, I recently came across a publication in Jack where they described in a mechanical electrical um, thrombectomy system where the electrical system, I guess, you pass with a wire, which uh, attaches to the thrombus with the positive electric, uh, 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 I guess, uh, disparities between them. And then you pull it back into the uh, aspiration system. Mm -hmm. um, I guess maybe I was curious about your thoughts about this and then if you have any other ideas going forward for, for innovation. Uh, you, you're talking about what, what system was this again? It used ultrasound or it used, the what did it use? Magneto system. Yeah. I guess it's, it's called. It's, yeah, it's, I, I just saw it now as well. It's going to, uh, it was referred to me for an innovation day presentation. So ah. there's about, there's about like 12 new devices coming out. Yes. For primary embolism. Yes. Uh, Twelve, maybe even underestimation. Yes. Of the number of companies that are working on different devices to try and increase uh, better aspiration. The one I think Matteo is talking about, they use some sort of magnetic current as well wow. to okay. attach and suck out the thrombus. I think you know, Matteo, we're just going to have to wait and see. I mean, clearly, if there's so many companies in this field, and we'll get to my last question, uh, there's clearly a a clinical need. Right, yes. and people yes. think this is interesting. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. go ahead, as no, no, I was just going to say I'm actually not aware of that device, but I'm aware of another device that uh, that is actually available in the market that uses um, ultrasound agitation. So you know, it's kind of similar to uh, Angiovac, but not really. So I'm not Angiovac. I'm sorry, it's uh, Angiojet, but mm -hmm. sort of similar to it, but a little different. Um, so they they use that to help agitate the quad and they think that it might be better. You're absolutely right. There's a lot of money and devices being um, thrown into this field because of the need. Yeah. Sam? Thank you, Asma, for a great talk. Uh, I think my question is, do you see any role with this current innovations and evolving field that we're going to need open, you know, the surgical thrombectomy in any kind of patient at this era at time? Oh my God, yeah, yeah. No, I, I definitely think there is a, a, a role for uh, surgical embolectomy. Actually, we, uh, I mean, there's, I mean, the C, CTEF patients, hopefully they, um, you know, we are trying to develop a CTEF program as well, but there's definitely a role for surgical embolectomy in the acute setting and as well as in the, you know, chronic P setting, of course. I wish, um, I wish, uh, Jamil was here to answer this question, but I, you know, we we recently had a patient who had a massive, like literally a ball valve clot in transit, and um, we did not think we'd be able to successfully take it out, or you know, with so we sent them to more open open surgery. So so there's always cases that that you know that are that do best with surgical embolectomy. 
um, although that may become less and less as these devices become more facile and uh, you know as they become more safe and more facile but there's all but there was always a role for that all right um Judah, did you have a question or comment hey good morning guys uh thank you asma that was a, a great talk um Sort of springboarding on, on what you were talking about before, um, you know, PE treatment, particularly interventional based therapies are, are not the common, are not, are not common in the United States. They're obviously growing. Uh, what do you think the main barrier is right now for the average hospital system for implementing PERT programs? Is it, do you think that the technology is not there? Do you think the data is not there? Uh, or do you think that, um, uh, that, uh, that there's some other barrier? Uh, you know, I think it's muscle memory. You know, we're used to doing things a certain way, and it's very dif difficult for hospital systems to break patterns and break habits. It would have been easy if there was a trial which said, you know what, ABC is much better than XYZ. And again, so lack of data plus the hospitals are used to doing what they do for a very long time. So the combination of those two things makes it difficult for, for, for innovation to come into the hospitals and for new things to be adapted. But, but it's actually a combination of all of the above, what you said. I, I've heard that Peerless, uh, they're going to be doing a second iteration of the trial where they're comparing um, the essentially the Inari Flowtriever to uh, anticoagulation alone. Yes. And I think that's really the one trial that will make a difference in this space. Yes, exactly. I mean, I, I would hope that, uh, you know, it, it shows something positive. But honestly, I, in my opinion, we, we, you know, the data is always, the lack of data doesn't, you know, the, the lack of evidence, lack of data doesn't mean lack of evidence. It just means that we haven't really studied or we have, we are empowered to study that. But you're right. Hopefully that, you know, that will show us that, that, that this is where this space needs to go. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great comment. It kind of finally someone touches on what my final comment on question was to Asma, is that <clears throat> all of us who've done this and have been involved in it clearly know it makes patients feel better. Mm -hmm. And there's a benefit to the patient who's crashing, who's going downhill. When you do this, you see them get better, right? Immediately. Mm -hmm. Yet, just looking at your presentation today, there's no data. I yeah. mean, yeah. I would say no data is not fair. There's no great data that will lead to a guide, a, a class one guideline indication. Absolutely. Because most of the data is with surrogate endpoints, mm -hmm. okay? There's no true sort of mortality data or long-term data, and there's no randomized data. And that's, I think, the biggest challenge. I mean, I, I say this because I've, I've been, I was recently been involved with trying to help design a clinical study for a new device in this field. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a challenge because, mm -hmm. you know, part of why the field is not growing as quickly as it should be, I think, is the fact that we don't have a good randomized study saying that this is better than standard of care even. Yeah. You know? And that's why I think when I, when I hear you guys say, because when I saw your graph uh, of the, what's it, is it called Peerless, the study? Or yes. Peerless or whatever? Yes. Um, the comparison was catheter-directed thrombolytic, but I was gonna, I said to myself, but hang on, we, we need a really good randomized study compared to just anticoagulation mm -hmm. with something, with some hard endpoints. I'm not sure with the number of patients they plan to enroll will be able to show mortality difference. That's correct. But, but we do need to show something in a randomized fashion because otherwise I think it will, what, you know, it will continue to be challenged to offer this therapy to a large group of patients. And right. I'm surprised by the fact, and Guillem, you can you can correct me if I'm wrong, that in Europe they don't have any of these catheters approved for thrombectomy. Right. right. They have ECOS, so, mm -hmm. but they don't have Inari. They don't have Penumbra approved for PE. Uh, right. And so in the whole continent of Europe, they're not actually doing you know catheter directed thrombectomy. That's correct. Yeah. It, Inari said they just did uh, their first cases in Germany, like literally this past year. So. Like you said, it's it's not available and it's you know it's not approved yeah. just because of again what we are saying lack of hard data and hard endpoints, which is yeah. just kind of sad. And again, given the fact that it's so difficult to do, you these studies would have to be immensely powered for us mm -hmm. to show actual mortality benefit. Right. So that's kind of hard to do with 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 patients like these. Is there at least like a national registry in the United States collecting data on this? 
uh, yeah, if you are a part of the PERT consortium, then mm -hmm. uh, they take your data and, you know, uh, then they, they, they basically, it's kind of, kind of like NCDR, you know, so they okay. collect your data and then they see how they, how you're doing. Yeah. Right. It, right. And you have to be a part of the PERT consortium. So actually I'm, I'm going to talk to them. I'm, I am on, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in PERT consortium. I'm in many committees. So I'm going to talk to them and see what we need to do to make our hospital a part of the uh, PERT consortium's data. So that right. we, you know, we at least, um, you know, we are able to. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, um, from the questions you see asthma, how much interest there is. And I think, I think most of us on this uh, session uh, really believe in this field and believe this field is going to grow and import and show and help develop important life-saving therapies for patients. I think we still don't need to be sure we we help collect good data yes. and we help generate good randomized data. Yes. But um, I think we're very lucky at Monty to have someone like you who is really at the cutting edge of this field and is committed to growing a PERT program here and to do it scientifically. So thank you so much for Thanks, your time, your effort, thank and you everything you're doing in the field. Thank you very much. Thanks all. Have a good day. Thanks, Asma. Bye-bye. Well you. done. Bye. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Bye.